Today, we're going to talk about a dangerous red flag that's too risky to ignore. And I just want to be candid with everyone. I saw this title on uh, one of my contemporaries, Matthew Hussey's page. And uh, I was actually on his page because he just got married this weekend, so or this past weekend. So uh, at least <coughs> I believe he was. Um, there were some pictures on Lewis Howe's page. So, And I thought, oh, let me just check out his site. And um and I briefly watched this video and I wanted to give you my take on this particularly dangerous red flag. Now, it's not the one that he shares. The one he shares is critically important to be aware of. Now, when we talk about red flags, we're talking about, see, to me, there's a red flag means ask deeper questions and then there's a deal breaker. So there's deal breaker, red flags, yellow flags, and then green flags. That's the way I interpret that. And in his particular video, he talks about a significant red flag that should not be ignored. And that is the red flag when someone says they're not looking for a serious relationship. Now, I wanted to, ref and, and by the way, I have my take on a more significant red flag for those of us that are in our 40s, 50s, 60s, and even 70s. So I want you to stay tuned for this critically important, dangerous red flag. But the red flag of, I don't know if I want a serious relationship. Well, I was thinking about my son, and there's a picture of my oldest son right there. That's a picture of Colin with his brother, Connor. That's my son who passed away. That's a picture of Connor as well. Um... You know, he's 27 years old. Does he want a serious relationship in his life? I don't think so. I don't think he's ready to consider marriage. I, I know he'd like to maybe have someone special in his life, but he's not in that space where he's ready to get married, buy a house, start a family with someone. So when someone that age, when someone is younger that says, you know, I'm not looking for a serious relationship, it's kind of understandable. And I think what happens for the younger generation is that they might be confused for a variety of different reasons, particularly those, um, those millennials and Gen Xers that are a byproduct of so many divorced parents, they might be a bit gun shy to jump into a significant relationship. So I think it's rather understandable why that might happen. And I think for them, what happens is when they meet the right person, they become more attached to the idea of something serious. So for a younger person that says, I don't want a serious relationship, that's kind of understandable. Now, what about those men in their 40s, 50s, and even 60s or 70s? What about those men that say, I don't want a serious relationship? Well, it's kind of understandable why a lot of men in their 40s, 50s, 60s, and even 70s say this because they are most likely divorced people. See, divorce causes someone to become gun shy to a significant relationship, particularly if it wasn't, a, if especially if there was a financial component that was very, where the person is dissatisfied with the results. Because when you think about marriage, when you think about it, it's not, it's a relationship with the government. You know, there's no, it's not like going into a partnership at a, a law firm or an accounting firm where you have a contract with one another. You know, this is a contract with the government and it basically says the government decides how you're going to split your assets. So a lot of men and women are gun shy to a serious relationship in midlife. That's not uncommon that someone might be gun shy. Now, a significant percentage of people in midlife also might be widow, I mean, might be um, a widow or widowers, you know, in this particular case. That could create a certain level of gun shy because you might feel deeply hurt. Most people in midlife have had a significant relationship. They might have been hurt. So it's very common for people to feel gun shy about a significant relationship. And it is a red flag. That's a red flag. Now, again, I'm going to go into a more important red flag for those of us in our 40s, 50s, and 60s. That has to be addressed because I think this is even more dangerous than the person who's gun shy. The reality is, is I'll be, I'm going to raise my hand. After my divorce, the last thing I wanted to do was get remarried. And that lasted for seven to 10 years. You know, I got divorced at 40. 
And I, I didn't even want to be in a serious relationship. I wanted companionship. I wanted connection. I wanted sex, but I didn't want the emotional responsibility, nor I, was I even capable of the financial responsibility of a significant relationship. Think about the word significant relationship. I mean, what's the point of going serious if you're not going to go all in at some point? I mean, if you think about it, it's either casual I mean, a lot of people are in what's known as situationships, but it's either casual or it's moving towards something fully committed, either moving in together or getting married. At least that's something more serious. But I know for a long period of time, I didn't want to have a um, to get remarried. And a lot of men and women feel the same way. I've since changed my tune. So I will say this. It's a big green flag if a man says, I want to get remarried or I want to get married. That's a gigantic green flag. Be on the lookout for those green flags because men who are very serious about commitment, they don't waste time with the wrong person. They evaluate quickly. And if she's not the one, he knows it within 90, maybe 120 days. He's not going to spend much more time if he's serious about commitment. That addresses the, a big red flag. Those who say I'm not ready for a serious relationship. But I want to address a bigger red flag, a more dangerous red flag. And it's there's two folds to this red flag. First, if someone has a contentious relationship with an ex, a contentious relationship with an ex. But furthermore, a person who takes no ownership of the ending of their relationship. They take literally no ownership of why the relationship ended. That is a gigantic red flag. Now, the first part, and there, these are two kind of big, you know, I, you know, these are two red flags. They're like different side of the coin because oftentimes a person who doesn't take ownership for the ending of the relationship most likely has a contentious relationship with an ex, okay? It's usually the case. The person that has the extremely contentious relationship with an ex, you are getting that baggage in this relationship. Any, You are going to be a party to their suffering going on, okay? You are going to be a party of that. And a person, most men and women don't really do very well navigating <clears throat> The, the contentiousness of the relationship, and it's going to bleed into any new relationship. It's going to bleed into it. I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of sad to say this, but, you know, you, you don't buy just the cow. You get the farm. You get all the, 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 the old, uh, you, get the, the, you get the cow. You get the barn. You get the tractors. And if it's all a mess, you're having to get, you're getting all of that as part of the package. But what's more important is the person who takes no ownership for the ending of their relationship. See, oftentimes this is what happens. I'm pointing the finger at you. You're pointing the finger at me. You know, it's kind of like this. And I've come to real, first off, I'm going to take ownership for the ending of my marriage. I was a very unconscious husband. I take full ownership of my part. I wasn't the best husband. I wasn't. Now, and to the extent, I don't know if she takes ownership for her part, but there were parts of the relationship that she was no picnic to be with. See, a lot of times when people don't take ownership of their part, it's actually a sign that they're not a really introspective person, or more importantly, it could be a sign they lack emotional maturity. I'm going to say it. If you're not familiar with my emotional maturity relationship skills chart, okay, Which is, please forgive the glare. You know, this is not a fact, it's merely an opinion, but I believe 20% of the, this is emotional maturity with respect to relationship skills. I believe 20% of the population has clinical issues. I mean, real, real messed up stuff. And sadly, you know, if they haven't done any healing for it, it could be a real mess being in relationship with them. And why I say 20% of the population is emotionally healthy, I'm being generous when I say 20%. Most everybody is dysfunctional. And depending on the degree of their dysfunctionality will give you a clue on their capacity to be in a healthy, happy relationship. And so, you know, 
I, I think it's really important to do your due diligence when you are dating. Look at, I've jokingly said you need to interrogate people on a date. Now, let me just say this. I say that tongue in cheek. And yet, what is dating? Dating is a vetting process. By the, way, by the way, if you need support on that, check out the link right there to schedule a discovery call with me. See if working with a coach is right for you. There's links below to get a, to um, the links in the description to find out how you can connect with me and a lot of different things. But vetting, dating is a vetting process. But Jonathan, it's all about having a good time and I'm just supposed to sit back in my feminine energy and let the guy claim me. Folks, we are swimming in a sea of dysfunctionality. If you don't know this by now, if this is your first clue of this, then go back and watch another hundred of my videos. We are swimming in a vast sea of emotionally dysfunctional people. And so this is really, dating is a vetting process. It's a screening process because we can't assume everybody is emotionally mature. You know, and chemistry is a very deceptive thing. I've been bitten by the chemistry bug more time than I can count. I mean, I'm saying that a little tongue in cheek, but, you know, you can have chemistry with someone, but that doesn't mean that they're capable of being in a relationship and a person who doesn't take ownership on their failing within the relationship. And I'm going to say the word failing. We all have to take ownership of our part. OK, I'm going to take greater ownership for the end of my marriage. But, you know, we were young. We didn't know shit. We were I was stupid. She was. Oh, I don't want to characterize her, but I was stupid. I didn't know any better. You know, this shit, this stuff isn't taught to us growing up. So so my point is. Either a. They are going through a contentious relationship with their ex. You are buying that cow whether you like it or not. And that's a red flag because you're, you know, if, if unless you have some real significant stamina, just be careful of that one. But more importantly, be careful of the person, whether it's a man or a woman who doesn't take ownership of their part of the ending of the relationship. And I've dated women. It's always the ex-husband. You know, he's always a narcissist. He's a sociopath. He's an alcoholic. He's always all about them. I invite you, do you take ownership of your part of the ending of any relationship? Because if you don't, that's a red flag, at least in my book. I know that's going to turn off a lot of you because you feel like it was 100% the other person's fault. It's never 100%. Even if it's, you know, you've got to take ownership. Even if it's 2% of your part, you have to take ownership because that demonstrates emotional maturity. And when you're emotionally mature, that's a green flag for stepping into a, a potentially healthy, happy relationship with someone. I mean, there's nothing easy about this stuff, folks. There's nothing easy about this. You know, I know we all have this fantasy. It should be really easy, but I'm here to say it's dating. You know, I said this in a recent video, dating sucks. It really does. We are, because of the, the sea of dysfunctionality we swim in, and also because we have a, per listen, you know, I think sadly, these devices, I mean, are these apps, you know, I, I, folks, I'm a dating relationship coach. I should be the biggest advocate for online dating. I'm, I'm not anymore. I'm, I'm not saying that there isn't, by the way, let me be clear, 50, 60, 70, 80% of all new relationships will happen online. So obviously it does work. Okay. But I think online dating can create a lot of inner turmoil. You know, these apps like, you know, let's take a look at this one. I haven't registered for it yet, but that's Bumble. You know, I think swipe apps have marginalized the getting to know you process because it's like cold calling. It's like just picking up a telephone and dialing for dollars, dialing for, you know, there's an old uh, uh, sales adage, dialing for daughters, dollars. That's what it feels like. You know, I, I, I'm going to share with everybody a meme I posted today on Instagram. I'm going to read the meme and then I want to tell you the quote I had to go with it. It says, here, I'll just show it to you for everyone. I've stopped looking for love. It knows where to get me. 
if I need it. Okay. But my, my quote was this, and I want to share this with you all because I hope you find some value in this. When my marriage ended, I was on the dating apps the very next day. When my significant six-year relationship ended, I was on the dating apps two days later. Why did this happen? Because I was for searching for something lost. I was searching for something lost. That something lost was me. This time, I'm going to do things differently. Instead of looking, it's time to manifest and be what I want to attract, be what I want to attract. And now that I have found me, I don't need to look anymore. I don't need to desperately look anymore. Folks, I've come to realize the reason why my relationship, I'm going to take ownership on this part. My relationship, my, the benefit that uh, occurred during my relationship with Marie is I was still searching for this. What is my book called? What the heck is self-love anyway? A journey of personal development, self-help, spiritual work. By the way, there's a link to get a copy of my books I recommend. I realized that I, when I met her, I was still in a slightly desperate place to want to be in a relationship. And how do I know that I'm not desperate anymore? Because the relationship's been over for well over three months. I haven't felt a desperate need to go on the dating apps. I haven't put together a match.com profile. I'm not putting any effort into trying to meet someone. I now believe in the power of manifesting, putting yourself in places where you can connect with like-minded people so you can attract somebody who's more aligned to who you are and what you want. Now, that's not to say I'm not going to do online dating. I'm still It's still a spoke in the wheel, but there's a big difference. The energy is I feel so much more whole within myself that I don't need someone to fill that. And my hope is I can manifest someone rather quickly. But you know what? That's the, you know, the journey of life isn't about whether or not you go the distance with someone. The journey of life is the experiences. And let me just say this. While a lot of dating apps can be very predatory and and, and there's a lot of catfishers and scammers. I know so many couples who have met through dating sites. So I'm still a strong advocate for it if it's done in a healthy way. Most people, but the swipe apps, the bumbles, the Tinder, it's just marginalizing people. And I'm more aligned with at least the dating sites that has more robustness. And again, when you are using these mediums, what is dating? Dating is a vetting process. Most importantly, you want to make sure these three things when vetting. This is my relationship iceberg. Okay, chemistry is the first thing we see. That's attraction, but you have to vet for compatibility and that's shared values, blendable lifestyles, and emotional maturity. And sometimes people can go in with the best intentions like Marie and I did. And I feel like we were close, but we were still a little misaligned. She was in a different place in her life. And at the end of the day, you have to be on the same page. You have to be on the same page. And it might look like you're on the same page in the beginning, but that's what dating is about, is to you have to be in enough experiences to determine if you're on the same page with one another. But guess what? You're not going to be in a good relationship if you don't ferret out their emotional maturity, their, their past experiences. Do they want a relationship? These are all factors to strongly consider when you're making the effort to attract in a soulmate. Is this sinking in? Is this resonating with you? Please let me know. If it is, please post a comment below. I'd like to hear your thoughts. If you find value in this video, please hit that like button. Please share this video. Please subscribe to my channel and hit that notification bell so you can be notified of new videos as well. All right, it's time for Q&A. If you have a question, write the word question and post the question there after, or you can purchase a super sticker, super chat. All the monies, there's a little dollar sign in the chat box, and if you're watching the replay, you can hit the super thanks. All the monies from the super sticker, super chat goes to a scholarship fund in the name of my son, Connor Asley. That's a picture of him right there. That's my son who passed away five years ago. In his honor, we donate to causes like the Hoffman Process and Insight Institute. And by the way, I just got a letter from Weijin, if you're watching right now, 
She went to the Hoffman process. By the way, if you're not familiar with it, here's the book version of it. But she went to the retreat. Okay. The Hoffman process. She wrote me this sweet letter. I want to share this with everyone. Dear Jonathan, during our last evening of class session, I expressed myself. Your transformation brought me to this process. I feel so much love and gratitude from here because of your demonstration. Thank you, Jonathan. Big bear hugs. Love you, Weijin. By the way, folks, if you haven't checked out the Hoffman process, I highly recommend it. And well, listen, anyone that does attend, I will donate $100 to your attending the Hoffman process. All right, it's time for questions. Let's see what we've got in the house, okay? Oh, I want to give Margaret a props of uh, for thanking for the $8 super sticker. Our goal tonight is $50, $50, and we are $8 away, so we need $42 more dollars to get there, okay? All right, I saw we had a question here earlier. Bump, bump, bump. Maya, it's enough to say I own my part in my past failed relationship. I believe that ownership includes sharing specifics of my and your negative behavior patterns that contributed. Thoughts. Um, well, we're going to certainly, you know, to some degree, you know, we're going to point out the deficiencies that came from our partner, okay? Okay. Taking ownership of how you might have compromised yourself, how you maybe didn't. You know, keep in mind, your ex-partner has a version of what they thought was failed in the relationship. Maybe it would be interesting to hear their perspective to find out, to add that to your narrative. But remember, there's two sides to a story. If you're pointing the finger at another person and taking no ownership, then that's a lack of emotional maturity. If you're pointing, and by the way, I don't think it's important to go deliberate to deliberate the specifics. I think it's better to talk in generalities because if you're still talking about specifics, you might, the other piece of, oh, I didn't say this in the video. If you're harping about your past you know, your past, the, the other person being at fault, that means you're stuck in the past as well, most likely. And um, whereas you take ownership of your part, you share the, you don't, uh, you don't get into the, the minute details, you say it in a big picture, and then you move on from there. Okay. Thank you for that question. That was really good. All right, let's keep going. Bum, 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 bum. Let's keep going. I say, okay, here's a question. Oh, same person. I'm divorced lady, 63, two adult sons. I want to prioritize my man in a committed relationship and have him reciprocate. How can we do this when our adult kids' interests may need priority at times? Okay, great question. So I have a business. I have a son. I have siblings. I have friends, I have my health, I have my spirituality. All of these things are important to me. And any one given time, they might have significant importance. And I make them a priority. Now, if I was in a romantic relationship with someone, I would include that in the list. They're all important. See, balance in life is, is, is having what matters most to you within your circle and you make priority when needs a priority. So if my son called me and said, hey, dad, you know, my car broke down. Can you help me out? And I'm, you know, on a date, I might, I might cancel the date. Or I might say, hey, go, you know, find a tow truck in your area. Okay, if, let's say I got that call. I would share that with my date and she might say, hey, you know what? Take care of your son. In that moment, I make him a priority. In that moment. I don't believe putting something up on such a pedestal that they're constantly a priority. I do believe if you are actively dating someone, that person, by the way, ladies, if the penis is going inside the vagina on a regular basis, I'm a believer that that, that relationship should have some significant importance in both people's lives. You know, I think the problem today is casual dating means it's just, you know, it's just like, ah, you know what? It's like going to the gym. No, it's more like, no, that's not it. It's like shoe shopping. 
yeah, I'm going to go to the store and I'll try on some shoes. And yeah, I'll go to another store and try on some shoes. And then I'll go to Nordstrom's and I'll try on some shoes. And you know what? I, the beauty of Nordstrom's is I can go take these shoes and I can go walk around and scuff them up and everything. And I can bring it back to Nordstrom's and return it. Well, that's exactly what dating is like today. There's, it's like, you know, it's not even, it's a lease with a potential to buy and not even people are buying that. They're just returning them. And so I'm a believer that everything in your life, important things will be, have at times take precedent over other important things. But if you're constantly making one important thing a priority of everything else, that means the, you know, then there's no balance in life. That's my opinion anyway. By the way, if you want to jump on the hot seat, I just put a link. If you want to get on the hot seat, I put a link there if you want to ask me a question directly. And you're welcome to ask me any personal questions as well. Hey, Elizabeth's in the house. I met someone and they said they want a serious relationship. I sort of like them. I'm not feeling it 100%. Been out four times. What do I say? You know, I've observed women... Sometimes I've observed women and men that it takes time to warm up to somebody. You know, when we're meeting cold people, it takes a longer time to warm up. That's why sometimes some of the best relationships happen with people in a work environment because they spend all this time getting to know them. Is four times out enough to know someone to see who their character is? Maybe, maybe not. Um, but you sort of like them, you know, I mean, what do you sort of like? What is it that you sort of like? What makes you want to say yes to them? Are you doing it from a place of sincere curiosity or is it just killing time? If you're just killing time, it's not fair to him. Anyways, I hope I gave you some insight on that one. That's just my two cents from that. I need more details. Ron says, how do you break up a long distance relationship since it isn't, it isn't a real long-term relationship anyway, <laughs> by text, by email, I mean, or by phone. I mean, that's how you would do it by text, by email or phone. I think it's lame to do it by text or email, but if you, you know, I think by, you know, I would just simply say, you know, and by the way, you get to, by the way, Ron, you get to use the lame go-to excuse. I'm not happy doing a long distance relationship and I'd much rather find someone who lives close by. I mean, that's the lame, that's, that's the how you do it over the phone. You can do it over email too. You can do it over text. You know, I mean, the reality is, is you're not going to see this person ever again. Um, and by doing it via text, it takes away some of the, the con potential contentiousness. I mean, I'm not saying it's the, the most gentlemanly way to do it or, or lady like way to do it. But let's face it. It's part of our lexicon anyway. So, um, and I would just, you can just use the standard excuse. I'm just not happy doing long distance. It's just the, the reality of long distance is a risky undertaking long distance date. By the way, it's not long distance relationship. It's a long distance dating dynamic. And unless you have a plan like at least, you know, we were, we, when we met, we were like, okay, if this is going to work, then we'd have to be in the same city. And at that point, and we just like, what the hell, we'll just live together and take our chances. And a year later, it didn't work out. That's okay. I'm not, I don't lose any sleep for it. Uh, and I don't think she has, um, cause it was a good relationship that didn't work out. That's okay. It's okay that a relationship doesn't work out folks. It's okay. Anyways, Ron, I hope that answers your question. Um, let's keep going here. One of my Facebook members says, is it enough to say I failed to draw boundaries in a relationship? Yeah, you could say I, I was very weak at drawing boundaries in my relationship. I have a propensity to be a people pleaser. That sometimes is a red flag too. Um but I also didn't give my partner their needs. You know, that's the other thing. You know what? Taking ownership is, is, is also saying, you know what? I wasn't there to fulfill their needs either. There was a misalignment between the two of us. Angela wants to say another red flag is someone who disagreed, 
disregards what you say that you want in a relationship. I want an extroverted, older, retired gentleman who didn't have young children. He skipped everything. I don't know what he skipped, but uh, thanks for sharing. Hey, I want to give uh, M. Solomon some props for the $9 super sticker. So guess what? We have $18 now. We have $32 away to get to our $50 goal. I'd love to donate some money to anyone that wants to go to the Hoffman process. All right, let's keep going here. Oh, gotcha, Ron. Okay. Jubilee says, I've been outside of a 10-year relationship by eight months. I watch you a lot regarding your books at 70. It's very limited dating. I enjoy my own company. Yeah, you know what, folks? I'm just going to be blunt. It's not, a folks, if you're over 50, you know, even, you know, there's no guarantee. A hundred percent of you will not find your soulmate or your, your true love. Let's use true love. Does anyone remember the movie Princess Bride? Too, true love, too blave. <laughs> I'm going to tell you, very few people are going to actually find their true love. There'll be people that find relationships and there'll be some mediocre relationships out there. But very when I say very few, I'm going to say it's less than 50% will find their true love. And it's probably less than 25%. That's the reality. This is why it's imperative to have a rich, full life on your own. You, you feel like coming back to when I realize I now feel like I love myself, whether I meet a, a partner or not, that's okay. It's okay. Do I want one? Absolutely. But it's okay if I don't have one either. And I believe that's what you're saying, Jubilee. Okay, let's keep going. Uh, bum, 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 bum. Blessed is in the house. And she says, four months ago, Four months going out on dates every weekend with 51-year-old, no sex, my rule. He invites me to, invites and pays for everything. I'm having a hard time getting to know him on an emotional level. Great question. I want you to read this book, Blessed. Emotional Intimacy by Robert Masters. Folks, most humans, I have you guys are clueless. I'm fucking clueless at emotional intimacy. I'm still scratching the ant's belly of emotional maturity. And I read this shit and I do this for a living. So folks, you got to learn, you got to figure what this out this is if you want to have it with another human being. Well, Jonathan, I just supposed to sit back in my feminine and let the guy do all the work. <laughs> folks, I just sometimes like to make fun of, um, of a few coaches out there that they think it's all about feminine energy and you'll just magically make things work. Human behavior, we humans are riddled, you know, with riddled with, 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 you know, foibles and flaws and shit like that. You know, folks, I want to share something with you. I want to give you 11 things, 11 things to think about when it comes to human mating. Okay. Here's my list. Okay. First off, we have instinct. That's our gender-based stuff. That's the hunter. That's the provider. That's the nurturer, the hunter. That's our instinctual stuff. Okay. Then we have our biology. Okay. Our hormones, our pheromones, our, you know, do we have a penis? Do we have a vagina? Nowadays, I can't figure out any gender stuff, but whatever it is for you, there's a hormone and pheromone associated with whatever gender you are. Okay. Then there's socialization. How you were socialized when you were raised. Were you socialized to be a boy? Were you socialized to be a girl? And there's traumas associated with socialization. And especially today, there's significant traumas associated with that. Then there's our imprinting. This is the stuff where, you know, our childhood wounds, our traumas, the imago. If you're not familiar with the work of Harvell Hendricks, Helen Hunt, write this down, imago, I-M-A-G-O. Read this book. So you can understand this. This is our imprinting, our love attachment style. The traumas we experienced growing up, whether they were micro traumas or, or gigantic traumas. Then there's our culture and our religion. That plays a factor in this. Then our social economic status and our education. Were we poor? Were we undereducated? All of this plays a factor. Plus our physical well-being. 
plays a factor in all this? Are we introspective? Do we look inward? Do we have emotional maturity? Do we have emotional intellect? And most importantly, do we have the capacity to be radically honest, to be vulnerable, to be authentic, and to be transparent? These are all factors that go into this thing that we call dating, mating, and relating. It's not about sitting in your feminine energy. It's not about men need, men's testosterone is down, so he needs to go into the cave. Well, you got to take all these, you got to take this other shit into consideration. Because if you don't, you're, you're listening to a narrow narrative of how this shit works. Is this sinking in? Is this resonating? Please give me a thumbs up. By the way, I want to thank Kim Kong for the $9 super sticker. So that means we have $28 in the house. We need $22 more to get to $50. Oh, we just got $5 from Taylor. What does true love or soulmate mean? Signs of those relationships. So I think soul, I, I once did, I did a, quote, said, soulmates come into our lives to teach us lessons. And our true love goes to school with us each and every day holding hands. That's what I think is the difference between the two. Because soulmates are people that are here to awaken you to deeper connection to your soul. I think your true love is a person that, you know, two people that are connected with their souls want to grow together. That's my version of true love versus soulmate. So I'm ready for my true love. I think I got all my soulmates out of the way. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Magic entertainers in the house. I meant when I asked, is it normal to want different things from different people? Like one guy just wants to talk. Another one just wants sex. Another one wants a relationship. Well, are you... Are you going to be in relationship with someone, have sex with someone, and have a best friend somewhere else? Because I'm not a big fan of that, okay? I am not, a, if that's what you're describing, I am not a fan of that, okay? But can you, um, I guess it depends on how clean your energy is, you know? I think, you know what? So I now have a walk-in closet, okay? A walk-in closet that's empty. I have room for someone in my life. I don't go fill it up with a bunch of stuff. You have to make room for people in your life. So if your energy is split, I'm just not a big fan of that magic entertainer. So that's just my perspective on that. Hey, I want to give props to Connie Mason for the $20 super sticker. Folks, we are $2 away to get to our $50, 50, $50 goal. We're $2 away. Let's shoot for 100 tonight. So we're $52 away, okay? <laughs> um, sweetheart says, long distance doesn't necessarily mean it's not real. Though if you're not happy with it, that's cool. You know, what is real? What is real? What's a real relationship? I think a real relationship when trust is built. Trust isn't just about fidelity. Trust is, can I count on this person to be there for me when I need them? Does this person have my best interest at heart? That to me is a real relationship. Anything short of that, it's not a real relationship. In my book, does anyone, okay, subscribe to, okay, let me repeat myself. A real relationship is where trust has been built. And trust is, can I count on this person when I need them? Do they? Does this person have my best interest at heart? Because anything short of that, to me, is a casual relationship. That, to me, is not real. It's just transactional, okay? So let's differentiate between a, um, a, uh, a collaborative, partnership-based relationship versus a transactional relationship. Is anyone resonating with what I'm saying? I'm just kind of curious on that. All right. Thanks, M. Solomon. I appreciate it. Let's keep swimming here. Kim Kong, thank you so much. Hey, Weijin's in the house. Weijin, did you see? I showed your letter from Hoffman. Thank you so much. I showed it earlier. Big hugs to you. Uh, let's keep going. All right, sweetheart. Sweet art. 
Any tips on dating while celibate until marriage and vetting to know a man is serious uh, about celibacy? I don't know if you're, you've any experience with this and can provide some insight. So I, I'm going to be candid with you. I probably wouldn't date a woman who, would I date it? Well, I guess the question is how long it, well, celibacy, I don't have an issue with celibacy. No, let me retract that. I think I'd have an issue with a woman who doesn't want to be physically intimate. I mean, you know, like if she said, oh, I have to wait six months to a year, I probably wouldn't hold out for that. I'm just being honest with you folks. Probably wouldn't hold out for that. I certainly would want to build trust with a person. I'd want to share my dating vows with a person. If you're not familiar with my dating vows, check out the link below to check out my dating vows. I certainly believe if we've spent a hundred hours face-to-face -face time, we have built trust with one another. But if there's some arbitrary number that she's waiting for, I think that's a turnoff to me. I can't speak for other men. Um, you know, I just, I believe that physical intimacy is part of the decision-making process to want to be in. By the way, ladies, how many of you have told me once you had sex, the sex sucked with a guy? Do you really want to hold out for a year only to find out it's terrible and it's never going to get any better? I don't know. You know, that's just how I feel. But as far as celibacy, I mean, I'm not intentionally celibate, but I haven't had sex in three months. <laughs> but that's not intentional. It just happens to be a byproduct of I haven't dated anyone. All right. I just shared a lot. Power of cheese, says Jonathan. What do you think about viral videos, Cheesecake Factory date from hell and 48 Oyster date from hell? I haven't seen those videos yet, so I don't have a comment on it. I was thinking about the Jada Pinkett Smith and Will Smith announcement that they've been separated for a while and people are making a big deal about it. I'm like, who cares? You know, I think a lot of people stay married for the benefit of their children, the benefit of assets. I don't care what they do. That's their choice. Each one of you is on your own journey. That's my opinion on that. Hey, I want to thank uh, Taylor for the $10 super sticker. Let me just pull this up, folks. Um, so we're only $42 away. Taylor, thank you for the $10. I also want to thank, um, uh, wait, what were, where was it? I want to thank Connie as well for the $20. Big hugs to you, Connie, big hugs. Okay, let's go back to Taylor's question. I feel like my boyfriend and I of five years would have been engaged, but financially we aren't there yet like we planned. Why should I care if I have no reason to doubt the relationship? Well, grown-ups have grown-up conversations. And I don't, I, I don't know the specifics of what the financial reasons are. But two people that, you know, again, if you're going to merge lives together and you're going to merge finances together, certainly I'm a big proponent of a prenuptial agreement merely to have clarity on what's yours is yours, what's mine is mine, what we're going to do jointly together, how if something happens to someone who goes, what goes to our children, where goes this and that. I think it's good to have a contract. It's called a prenup, but um, I, I think you can do that and move forward and get married. That would be my quick 10 cent, you know, $10 suggestion there. Okay. M. Solomon is back in the house. I met a good man on match 10 months ago, kind, loving, generous, and he wants to, and wants to live together. I have fun with him, but my heart is not really there. I want to feel in love. I'm 61. God, if you've been together 10 months and you're not feeling it, you know, Someone really close to me was in a relationship for six months. And at the six month, at the three month mark, they came to me and said, I'm just not feeling it with this person. I said, give it a few more months. And it was six months in. I'm just not feeling. I don't know what it is. I'm not feeling that this person. Now, it might mean he's not feeling the unhealthy feelings of the Imago and uh, love attachment style. So, you know, it might mean you're not feeling the unhealthy feelings that make you think that it's love. The problem is too many humans are in great relationships and because it's not drama filled, it's not chaotic, they don't feel like it's love. So I invite you to look at how were you raised as a child 
Is it possible the way you view love is chaotic? I think this happens to a lot of women and men as well. I think the reason why we don't feel the butterflies is because the butterflies were anxiety that we were raised with. Anyways, that's just uh, my two cents on that one. Let's keep going here. Hey, does anyone want to jump on the hot seat? I'd love to have a conversation. Click that link there. I got to, I guess I got to watch this cheesecake factory date. Taylor says, where do I go really learn about prenups? I thought they were only for rich people, which neither of us. Oh no, for, folks, uh, first off, Google prenuptial agreement. There is tons of information. You could go to a paralegal to have it brought, uh, you know, created for one another. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's not for rich people. It's actually for anybody. All it really a prenup does is it basically, it's having a conversation about, well, if this doesn't work out, how do we want to treat each other? It's a grown-up conversation. It's like two business people entering into business together saying, if this doesn't work out, this is how we're going to navigate the ending if this doesn't work out. And it also protects other family members as well. So great question. You can Google prenuptial agreements. There's tons of information on there. Um, Power of Chi says trauma bond is a red flag. Yeah, it will, again, red flag is asked deeper questions. When two people are bonding through their mutual trauma, they think that's love. And it's, it's, it's really, um, oh, anyone wants to get on the hot seat, here's the link. Uh, to join the hot seat. Um, yeah, so just remember, you know, a lot of people are bonding through their, their current traumas with another person and it's temporarily, it feels good and safe. But believe me, you've got to do your individual work or you're going to be destined for a debacle, most likely. Um, Margaret said, no paralegal. Jonathan, you need a lawyer. No, it to do it properly. I, I don't know that. I, I mean, I'm, I know a lot of really comp, comp, competent paralegal. I'm just saying if you're simple and there aren't any assets, it's just a legal contract. I Again, I could be wrong on this one, so I'm, I'm not suggesting you're wrong, but I do believe, you know, for a lower price, you can get a paralegal to do it, but you, you got to find that out for yourself. Um, <laughs> Kathy McFadden says, yep, it's a mess. All right. Let's see. Bum, 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 bum. Oh, Taylor wants to say, does it protect my partner from my school and medical debts? I will Google. Thank you. Uh, yeah, you got to, you definitely, well, that and you want to talk to an attorney, somebody. I'm talking about drafting it could just simply be a paralegal. But if it's more complicated, then definitely you would need attorney. Hey, I want to thank uh, Sherry Fleming for the $20 super sticker. Gosh, we are probably only $20 away from getting to our $100 goal. So I'd love us to get to $100 tonight and donate some money. Um, if you want to join the hot seat, I just put the link right here in the chat box. Um, let's see. Let's see what we got here. Let's see. Cynthia said something. She goes, in your relationship, you have to be honest and truthful with each other. My make your relationship work. You know, here's the problem with honesty and truth. We humans have a capacity to lie to ourselves. Sometimes we're honest, but we're not honest to ourselves. So what comes out of our mouth is disingenuous, not intentionally. We are, we human beings are riddled with flaws, but yes, I think being vulnerable, being authentic, being transparent are critical factors for a relationship success. Uh, McCoy Hill Farm says, I tried really hard not to come unglued on high over the stuff. Just tell you, tell how I feel and deal with the aftermath uh, if, when it tries to say, what is wrong with me? I'm not really sure what you said, but thank you. <laughs> uh, 
Budge, Bug Out Adventure says, if I'm into a guy, I sing Barry White. First, last, first, last everything. You know, um, okay, songs that I think of when I'm excited about someone. Uh, uh, Friday, I'm in love by, is, oh shoot, now who's that by? Hey Google, who who sings Friday? Who sings Friday? I'm in love. Um, Friday, I'm in love was recorded by, by the Cure. That's what I thought it was. The Cure. I just went. Uh, then I also love Level Forty Two. Um, something about you. Uh, hey Google, Level Forty Two. Something about you. Um, I, those are two songs I sing quite a bit when I'm kind of in a really good mood. One of my favorite songs is by Joe Jackson. You can't get what you want till you know what you want. Uh, that's one of my favorite. What's your favorite song you sing when you're happily, you're feeling jazzed in love? What is a favorite song of yours that you sing? Um, so into you by Tamara. Tam uh, oh God, I am folks. I am terrible with names, so please forgive me. Um, uh, McCoy says it's okay, Jonathan. Sherry got it, and we sorted it out. I guess. Okay, good to hear. Uh, let's keep going here. Oh, McFadden says, "Be happy." That's a great song to think of uh, when you're when you've met someone special. Um, you know, um, I said this earlier. There's nothing easy about this process. Real, I mean, there nothing is. It's not easy. My hope is that my content invites you to think. I hope I'm getting you think outside the box. I hope that I'm inviting your brain power to work in different ways by in, in introducing you to books and recommending things. My goal is to just shift your perspective and maybe like Weijin and so many other great, beautiful emails I get from people that I'm making a difference in your life. If I'm making a difference, please let me know. Okay, some of the songs we're hearing. Be happy. I'm happy. Song from Dirty Dancing. I choose you by Sarah Borelli's. Um, Google is talking back to you. LOL. Uh, always and forever. Arlene has a question. I was getting to know someone. Why would they say, let's just have a good time? Let's just have a good time. It's all about having a good time. Let's have a good time. What that means is I want to get into your pants, but I really don't want to invest anything emotional with you. That's what a good time is. Katie says, um, does a guy who takes dating seriously not want to talk for days at a time? Great question. So when... I'm in the early stage of dating and I'm taking it seriously. I want to stay as connected as possible until we build trust with one another. Okay. So I want to stay as connected as possible until we build trust. When trust is built, I don't feel like I need to be on the telephone as much. And it's, you know, so I appreciate the physical time we're together. I mean, in other words, when we're face to face and certainly connecting on the phone, but when trust is built, I don't have a need to be on the phone as much. So when, and it takes time to build trust. So that's the process of getting to know someone. You build trust, you build trust, you build trust. And when you've built enough trust, you don't need to do it as frequently. At least that's how I feel about it. So, and not days at a time, but certainly a check-in text, an evening text, is fine. You know, maybe a telephone call if you know you're going to be apart for a few days. And then um, physically seeing each other. Like I've always said, ladies, the type of relationship I'm looking for at a minimum, we spend three or four days and nights a week together doing shared activities, hobbies, mutual interests, spending time with family and friends, traveling together, teamwork, building skills, both in our personal, our professional life, intimacy, both physical and emotional intimacy that leads to either at some talking about marriage or living together at some point in the future. But I am very clear on having these conversations sooner rather than later. So there's no ambiguity so that trust can be built much sooner rather than later. So thank you for that one. I appreciate it. Um, are there any singles in Chicago? I bet there are a million people who are single in Chicago. That would be my guess. Sweet Art says, Jonathan, certainly you're making a big difference. Well, I'm happy to hear that. 
Folks, my mouth is getting parched. Uh, <laughs> Kathy McFadden says, I would date you, Jonathan, but you're in California, LOL. I appreciate that. Sherry Fleming is a big fan of The Cure and Level 42. I'm happy to hear that as well. Um, hey, folks, I think this will be a great place for me to wrap up today. Did you find value in this? If you did, please hit that like button. Please share this video. Please subscribe to my channel. If you've got something to say, post a comment below. I'd like to hear all your thoughts. Um, and um, again, if you found value in this, please share this with friend, video with your friends and uh, subscribe to my channel if you're brand new. Okay, I'm going to wrap up this video as I always do. First off, give myself a big gigantic Jonathan Barrack of self-love. I'm going to reach into the camera and give you a hug of love if that's okay. I'm going to ask you to turn to someone, a pet, a teddy bear, a pillow, and give it or them a hug of love because hugs are a great source of love. And let's face it, we could all use more love in our lives. I want to thank Power of Chi, Chi and Ch uh, Fleming Sherry Fleming and the Magic Entertainer and Margaret and Peggy and Miss Cole and Katie and McCoy and Kathy McFadden and uh, Papa King Kong and Sweetheart and Flowers and Beach Lovers in the house and Weejin and all the beautiful people, Taylor, everyone, big hugs. Thanks a bunch. Bye now.